Hi, I'm Larry Magid, CEO of Connect Safely, which is the U.S. host of Safer Internet Day. And today I'm speaking with Antigone Davis, the global head of safety at Facebook. I've had a chance to work with Antigone for a number of years in my capacity as a member of the Facebook Safety Advisory Board, which Antigone uh, runs. So Antigone, welcome, and uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Hi, it's really great to see you, Larry. Antigone, let's start by talking about Facebook's general approach to safety. Well, to give you a sense of it, uh, Larry, we really try to look at it from a sort of a 360 degree view. So we look, first of all, at our policies. Do we have the right policies in place for what people can and cannot share? Do we have the right, second, do we have the right tools in place? Both the tools that you might see as a user default privacy settings, et cetera, but also the tools that might be running in the background, our machine learning, our AI. Do we have the right resources that are available for users? And then also, do we have the right partnerships in, in place? Do Am I speaking to, is my team speaking to the right experts to get the information? Do we have the right experts working at Facebook to get the right information to actually do a good job? You know, as somebody who's written a great deal about Facebook privacy, safety, and security going back to close to the founding of the company, not quite back that far, but certainly when they started opening up to the general public, uh, I've had a chance to do a lot of reading and writing and thinking about the granular controls that Facebook offers. And I think a lot of people are not aware of the fact that anything that you might not like about Facebook privacy, there may be a way that you can actually do something about it through the settings. Maybe not everything, but certainly a lot of things. And this came up a couple of weeks ago as I wrote in a piece that's on connectsafely.org uh, called Battening Down Your Facebook Hatches. Uh, my wife, Patty, who is something of a public figure in, in the Bay Area because she's a member of the Human Relations Commission in Palo Alto, had her site cloned. Uh, and suddenly there was a fake Patty uh, that was out spamming and uh, trying to get people to sign up for different things. And the good news is that once we got wind of it, uh, we notified Facebook and it was taken down, the fake one, was taken down almost immediately. But in researching how this might have happened, one of the things we realized is that Patty was sharing her friends list publicly. And that is one of many things that you can change if you go into the settings. Yes, yeah, so there are a number of ways that we try to make this clear, clear to people. First of all, you can go into your settings. And I recommend that people go into your settings on a regular basis, because at one point in time, you may have wanted to share more than you may at another point in time, depending on circumstantial changes. The other thing that we do is we have something called privacy checkup, which you can actually run through. So you don't have to run through each setting, but it takes you through some of the major settings to make sure that you have your settings in, the, in a place that you want. We also do some things in the background. So um, a while ago, we introduced something in, in which if you leave an app open, uh, that you're using through Facebook and you haven't accessed it for a long period of time, we will actually close that down so that any data that it may be drawing, it's no longer drawing. So there are a number of things that we're doing. I actually think it's interesting in relation to what, what Patty experienced, we also use technology in the background to identify impersonating and, back, uh, and fake accounts. Some of it you might see as a user. So certain users may occasionally get a warning, hey, we think this account may be impersonating you, please take a look at it. And then you'll report it as fake and as an impersonating account and we can take it down. Accounts that behave in a certain way that look like they're likely fake, we have machine learning and artificial intelligence so we'll actually block those accounts from ever being made in the first place. Well, what I was impressed with is how quickly it came down. Yeah. I didn't think it would happen within minutes, but certainly from the time I reported it, it was down within a very short time. Well, um, the speed actually is really, I think is key because what we do by using a variety, like a layered approach in which we have users who are reporting, in which we have background technology working together, that actually is how we're able to do things so quickly. Great. Well, I'm glad you were able to in her case. Um, let's talk a little bit about sort of the elephant in every room in America, in fact, the world today, which is COVID-19 and what Facebook is doing, both in terms of providing resources and information, and also battling the misinformation out there about the pandemic. Yeah, so one of the things that, that we um, have been doing, and I wanna kind of put at the top of this, is we have a COVID information hub where people can go to find accurate information, can find out information about where to go for the, to get vaccines, uh, the latest the latest protocols, et cetera. We have this not only in the US, but it's, this is regional. So we've been building it out with um, ministries of health around the world to ensure that people have access to good information because it's very important in a period like this for people to have access to good information. In addition, we have tight uh, health misinformation policies and we'll either uh, remove false claims or fact check 
or claims that have or reduce the re reduce their visibility depending on on where they sit within our policies again the goal for us is to actually get people to accurate information when they're looking for it and the other corollary of that is the emotional health of your members and the information you're providing or the resources you're providing to help people cope with what's going on around them right now. Yeah, so we do, we actually have resources inside of that same COVID information um, hub for mental health resources, for well being re resources. One of the nice things, even outside of those resources that we've seen on our platform, is a real resurgence of the kind of use of our platform to make the social connections that in so many ways it was designed for. So I've seen people who have, um, for example, reunions now with their with their college roommates, things that they that they could have been doing even before COVID, but something about the fact of being isolated has brought them together where they're doing things, where they set up Facebook groups to meet and, and connect with each other. And this is actually some of the nicest, um, size, nicest sort of silver lining of, of this difficult period. I'm glad you mentioned that because we tend to associate groups with all sorts of political and ideological groups. But in fact, they're mostly designed just to help people live their lives and hang out with their friends or people who have common interests, which for the most part have nothing to do with politics. I think that's right. I think oftentimes people are using the groups for things like um, neighborhood, neighborhood communities. I mean, I've seen I've seen groups actually for people who are actually dealing with health issues where mm -hmm. they will connect to um, link each other to different resources, particularly for health issues where, that may be sort of very unique and a very an impact a very small community. I've seen, we see people who have um, actually one of the one of the nicest ones that I saw dealing with a very difficult situation where was in the context of domestic violence, mm -hmm. where a group of, of women had basically set up a group where women could come to find houses where they could where they could go for shelter if they needed to escape um, a particularly challenging situation. So there are all kinds of groups on our platform for these types of purposes. But of course, anytime you open up a platform to literally billions of people uh, from all walks of life, even though most of them are gonna behave honorably and properly, you're always gonna get some who misbehave and in fact, we're seeing that both in terms of misinformation and also hate speech. And I know that Facebook has been working very hard to try to mitigate these problems, also at the same time trying to figure out ways to do it without violating anybody's rights of free speech. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about these programs and also how you do walk that very delicate uh, balance between uh, creating a, a good, safe, uh, appropriate environment and what some people have can accused you of, of censorship. Yeah, so it, that's, it's, it's a very challenging issue. And depending on the different circumstances, we take a different difference of approaches. But let me start very specifically with hate speech. So we don't allow hate speech on our flat, on, on Facebook. We, you can't attack people based on their race, on their ethnicity, on their religion, on their national, their national origin. And we will, we will remove it. We work with academics and experts and groups who help us sort of stay ahead of trends in this, in this area. In fact, a recent study from the EU, EU showed that we actually act more quickly and take more uh, hate speech off of our platform than many of the other major, major providers. That's because we've invested in things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to help, to help us out. But as you mentioned, this can be a very complicated area. And there often are, are places, speech that doesn't fall into the category of hate speech, but is actually prob problematic, is hurtful. And, and we have actually developed a number of tools for people on our platform to manage things like this. So for example, we have filters that you can put in place that can actually filter out comments that may not fall into the category of hate speech that would violate our policies, but might be personally upsetting to you in some way or another. Some, one, some of those filters work based on um, what we've generically found to be um, bullying or hate speech. So based on reports that come into us, but you can also personalize that filter. So if there's a particular thing that someone is bullying or harassing you about, you can actually put in the words very specific to that harassment and it will filter out those comments so that you don't have to be subjected to them. And as a reminder, uh, Facebook is a private company and the First Amendment applies specifically to government. And it's not uncommon for private entities to have rules of behavior, you know, the no shirt, no shoes, no service rule that restaurants have. There's nothing illegal about walking around without shoes, but a restaurant is free to decide that they require shoes in their restaurant. And the same is true with speech. I mean, uh, if you come into my home and start spouting racist or anti-Semitic or misogynist 
statements, I'm going to probably ask you to leave or certainly not to do that. And Facebook have a legal, and I would argue not only a right, but a responsibility to do that on its own platform. We don't allow hate speech. There are also areas where it can be very complicated, as you said, and not so much in the context of allowing hate speech, which we don't allow, but more in the, in the context, for example, when you have political figures and there's a certain amount of freedom of expression that you want to actually allow to occur so that people can make decisions about those political leaders so they can hear the information, they can assess who they are, and they can, and they can actually respond as, as they would by voting in one, one way or the other in relation to that in relation to that political figure. On the other hand, we don't allow hate speech. We aren't gonna allow the incitement of violence and we're going to take action against that kind of content. And kind of related to that, you know, you don't have to be on Facebook. You don't have to watch television to know that there's sort of an air of toxicity in this country right now. It, it, it's really kind of uh, something you even pick up sometimes at, at holiday family dinners, maybe or holiday family Zoom conferences going on these days. And I know that Facebook can't solve every problem in America or the world, but how do you approach this sort of general issue of toxicity that's so much part of all media, social and otherwise? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I think one of the key things is not, only, is not only something that we do, but I think it's actually something that we need to be thinking about doing broadly. And that really has to do with things like media literacy and media and media education. So we have actually a platform uh, uh, a program that we've put in place called Get Digital that we actually um, deploy across schools uh, in the United States. And what, we, what we're doing there is we're actually taking media literacy education into schools. And some of it starts with some basic understanding, understanding of interacting with another person um, online and actually also go, then goes far deeper into how to assess what you read, what are good, good tools for, detect, you know, for determining whether something is truthful or not truthful. How do I, how do I determine whether you, you know this person or you don't know somebody when they're trying to reach out to you online? It has a whole slew of lessons, lessons that can be actually implemented inside of the classroom, lessons that you can do on your own, but actually also lessons for parents that parents can do or caregivers can do with um, young children that they're caring for. And if I may take a privilege and pitch our own guide, uh, Connect Safe Leads, Parents and Educators Guide to Media Literacy and Fake News, which was co-written by myself with my perspective as a journalist and our education director, Carrie Gallagher, with her perspective as an educator, which deals with many of the same issues that you brought up. So thank you for the work you're doing in that area. Well, um, thank you. I mean, we, you've long partnered with us and have actually helped shape a lot of our a lot of our thinking and our resources, and and pushed us to to do more. And I, and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, the other thing I should mention is we have another video with somebody from the News Literacy Project, which is a a great nonprofit that's doing work in this area as well. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit something that's kind of a, a somewhat of an un, very much of an unpleasant subject, but still an important one that I know you're very passionate about, which is the protection against uh, protection against child sexual exploitation, and also how that how you deal with that in terms of Facebook's growing reliance on encryption. WhatsApp is already encrypted, and I know you're moving to encrypt other areas. And some people in law enforcement worry about that. But at the same time, I think we all have a shared responsibility uh, to do something about child sexual, sexual exploitation, what we call child pornography and other horrible things that unfortunately still occur. Yeah, so first and foremost, I, let me state unequivocally that we do not allow that on our, on our platform. How we go about preventing it on our platform takes a number of different, a number, we use a number of different techniques. And we, for one of the things that people know that we use quite often is, is photo matching technologies. We use these technologies to identify potentially known material of this kind, as well as technologies to identify new material that may be uh, produced and, and uh, shared on our platform. Uh, we will, we will, we use these in our public spaces and we will continue to use them in our public unencrypted spaces, even unencrypted spaces on some of our encrypted messaging. So for example, on WhatsApp, we actually use these technologies across things like our, the photos that people use in their, in their profiles or their, the de descriptions of their groups to help us find and, and remove accounts as well as, as, as well as content. So for example, um, WhatsApp has removed about 250,000, 300,000 accounts a month using these technologies. They're also made um, close to, uh, I want to say, I make it the 
I believe it's 400,000 reports to, to NCMEC with content. So we are using technology to actually prevent, uh, pre detect and report this content. In addition, we actually are working quite hard to actually prevent and reduce the sharing. One of the things that people um, have heard of late is that we make the, the largest number of reports on our uh, uh, compared to anybody else in the industry. That's because we use our technologies across different technologies across our platform. But I want to be really careful because one of the things that's happened of late is people think that this, these millions and millions of reports, 18 million Facebook reported in 2019, actually correlates to 18 million victims or 18 million images. While any image shared is terrible, it, that's it, that's not what's actually happening on our platform. In fact, 90% of the of the content that we reported to NCMEC last year actually was images that had previously been reported that our technology was detecting before before users reported it to us, removing it and and sending it to NCMEC. This is important because what it means is that people are not that there are millions and millions of victims, but that people are sharing this content and they shouldn't be sharing this and that we should be educating people prior to their sharing it. Because one of the things we do know is that when we educate people, they don't tend to necessarily share again. And so this is, I think, where, where a lot of what we're focused on now is actually how do we reduce the sharing in the first place? Because anytime this content is shared, it victimizes someone. And by the way, NICBIC stands for the National Center for Missing oh, and Exploited Children. Uh, and Antigone, I believe you are currently on its board. Yes. Uh, I was on its board for 20 years. We actually had an overlap in serving on the board. We did. Um, I hate to, to leave on a, on a down note, and unfortunately, child exploitation is. So I'm going to ask you a question you may not be expecting, which no. is what's your favorite use of social media? Oh, goodness. Actually, it's a really simple answer. My favorite use of social media is staying in touch with my daughter. She's 23. She lives um, in New York City at this point, which means I don't get to see her every day. I don't get to tell her to clean up her room every day. And I actually enjoy um, using social media to stay, both to watch the work that she's doing and to stay and actually to stay in touch with her through things like messaging. And I've got a hint for your daughter, because if she's like me, uh, her room may look really good on a Zoom call, but you, all you have to do is push it outside of the range of the camera and mom will <laughs> never know. Yes, trust me. I'm sure she's figured out every technique for avoiding my intrusions. <laughs> good for her. Antigone Davis, uh, Global Head of Safety for Facebook. Thank you so much. Thank you, Larry.